Welcome to Diligent Canine, and in this video I'm going to talk about socializing your dog. The first thing we need to get clear is what does socialization mean? And everybody tends to have a little different opinion about what, what it means to have a well socialized dog. And as I've mentioned in several other videos, that can depend greatly on the expectations and the goals that you have for you and the type of dog that you have. So for me, socialization means that I can get my dog to focus on me in any environment. So obviously this is, like training in general, is an ongoing process. There isn't an end to it. It is something that can continuously be developed and, and improved on in the future. Another way of putting that is that the dog will develop good experiences around novel stimulation. So in other words, socialization is the antithesis of fearful anxiety. When I talked about temperament testing and dog selection, um, I mentioned things to look out for uh, with the dog's environmentals when they're showing signs of fear and anxiety. So, Therefore, the purpose of socialization would be to combat that, to get a balanced or even excited dog, though not an uncontrollable dog, in virtually any environment. Or, even better, to redirect that energy and enthusiasm to you in those environments. Once you have a clear picture in your mind of what a well-socialized dog looks like and taking into consideration the types of activities and life that you want to have with your dog, you still need to fact check yourself with common sense. So I'm going to point out some things that are helpful tools in the socializing process with your dog, but they're not, they don't encompass or embody um, socialization on their own. In fact, they could very well be a catalyst for the opposite of socialization. So remember, we're talking about combating fear, apprehension, anxiety, trying to build confidence and calm in the dog. So um, what socializing your dog does not mean, it does not mean you just let your dog walk up to strange dogs in the street. It does not mean you see a stranger at a park or something and say or um, acknowledge someone's prompt to let's have our dogs meet. That is a bad idea. That's how bad things happen when you have no idea about the other dog or the other person. Again, I've talked about this before in other videos. I'll come back to, to it in this video as well. The other thing that socialization is not is it is not just taking your dog willy-nilly to pet stores and um, hardware stores Home Depot, Lowe's, Tractor Supply, um, places like that. Although those places can be helpful, again, uh, especially the pet stores, there is so, so much that you can't control for that it really creates the potential for bad experiences to happen. The other thing that socialization is not, it is definitely not just taking your dog to the dog park and letting them go unchecked. Um, if it hasn't dropped already, then by the time this video comes out, there will definitely be a Q&A on why dog parks are a bad idea. Again, none of these things by themselves are inherently bad per se, except maybe the dog parks. Again, watch the Q&A on that. Um, those other things are the stores and meeting other dogs. Those are all good components, but there are some other things that we have to check out first. The first thing we need to consider after we figured out what a well-socialized dog looks like for us is how we're going to avoid stimulation and variables that we cannot control. That is extremely important and that is maybe the one takeaway from this whole video. Okay, It's the exact reason why any dog park is a bad idea and it's the reason why most or any given pet store is a bad idea as well and that's because we have no control over what other people will do or what other dogs do. So my dog Dean wears a harness and there are patches on the left and right side and in two inch letters it says do not pet. Two inch letters, that's like size 130 point font. I can't tell you how many people still ask to pet my dog. Now respectfully I tell those people no and I'm sincere when I say thank you for asking, 
because there are many, 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 many people who don't ask. And that's, not only does that not make sense, it's belligerent, it's selfish, and it's indicative of the just poor boundaries and entitled nature you have about yourself. So this is problematic, not because my dog is a jerk, not because I'm a jerk, it's problematic because I don't want my dog to look at other people as treat dispensers or constant sources of affection. I want my dog to look to me for those things. That's how I build a relationship and engagement with my dog is by teaching him that I will protect you and all good things come through me, be that food, play, relieving your bladder, things like that. Other people don't provide those things. Now, this is in the public sphere. At home, I allow people to pet my dog. When they're, if I invite a guest over, somebody's staying at my house, they're allowed to pet my dog. But that is our home, that has been more relaxed, those are people I trust, those are variables that I can control. I can't control what a stranger does on the street or in, a, in any given store. The other thing that's important to remember is that restraints builds drive, it builds frustration in the dog. In fact, dogs have a specific reflex called an opposition reflex, and that means if you um, like push on their rear gently, they tend to push their butt back into you. And the opposite is true, which is why leash pulling is one of the most common problems that you'll hear about with dogs. So when you pull back on the dog's leash, naturally the dog wants to continue to pull forward. So the harder you pull back to get your dog away from something, the, the more desirable that makes that thing. Which is why, as I've said before in this video, it's so important to do whatever you have to to re that, redirect the dog back to you. Say, hey, the food, the fun, the toy, whatever is going on is happening over here. It's happening with me. One more thing before we go back to how to utilize those things that I mentioned were uh, sometimes bad ideas is that you should increase the stimulation. In other words, the distraction. Um, this is true for obedience as well as socializing your dog. You should increase the stimulation in proportion to how well your dog is able to focus on you. So this is true. Um, again, when you're trying to manage any fear or anxiety, it's true when you're proofing your obedience or generalizing your obedience rather, um, as well as proofing it. It's true when you're socializing your dog as well. So you want, you don't want to move into a too stimulating environment that will shut the dog down or provoke um, an undesired response, say like a dog fight, because the dog is still gonna learn from that. The dog is still gonna take away a negative experience from that interaction with another animal or another person. You don't want that to happen. So you want to sort of be in this optimal stimulation range where the dog can manage himself. He still has his faculties about him or her, but it's not totally relaxed, like in your living room, and it's not overstimulating where they're starting to panic or want to fight or something like that. So how do I go about socializing my dog then? Well, with all that stuff that I just mentioned in consideration, um, hopefully you're taking your dog for walks or exercising them. Um, hopefully you are getting them out to either baseball fields or secluded areas of parks. Um, but that is where I start. I start sometimes in a public place, sometimes in my neighborhood, but I start by playing it cool. That's the first step for me. And what I mean by play it cool is I teach my dog that there's nothing to worry about. Again, I will keep you safe, I will reward you, I will take care of business. You don't need to make that decision. Dogs are notoriously bad decision makers. Um, even the best trained military dogs in the world, they, they still lick their own butts and eat cat food. So, Dogs don't make great decisions on their own. They're really good at listening to people and following routine and structure in their lives. So we need to build that routine and build that structure of calm and confidence. So let's say I'm walking my dog down the street in my neighborhood and somebody's moving furniture and, and they drop something and it makes a loud bang noise. My dog, probably pretty naturally, is gonna turn his attention to that thing, maybe even be startled. 
Well, I want my dog to redirect to me, so I might make some noise, tap them on the rear, okay, maybe pet them. But when the dog does look back to me, I want to remain as neutral as possible. So if the dog hears the noise, checks back with me, again, if I've been working on my behavior management at home and building my relationship with my dog, that process should come pretty naturally. So when my dog looks back to me, I want to play cool. I want my dog to learn that you hear something strange, check in with me, first of all, and that behavior should be rewarded, marked and rewarded. But also, there isn't anything to worry about. What's dad doing? Okay, dad's playing it cool. All right, let's keep going. So that's the first step, playing it cool. Once we've sort of mastered the playing it cool phase of socializing your dog, then we can start to increase the stimulation. And I find that it's easier to do this with people rather than with other dogs. So there are some things, some common environments and variables that you're gonna have to get your dog used to or that most or many dogs are commonly afraid of. So things like cars, bicycles, um, rollerbladers, um, things like that that move fast typically incite a prey drive in the dog. Um, also other people, um, hustle and bustle of stores, um, and things like that are stuff that you're going to have to manage with your dog before you can even think about uh, a, a pet store or a dog park or letting your dog free around other dogs. How do we do that then? So. I have posted a lot of videos on my personal page about myself just standing there with my dog Dean right here. Uh, he's sitting beside me as I'm standing on the sidewalk and you know with or without a leash again like this isn't something that happens overnight it's something that we've built up to but every time a car passes by or a person passes by I tell him to watch me and when he looks at me I mark and reward it. And then eventually uh, we get closer and closer to the sidewalk and I've done this on fairly busy streets and highways um, in fact I, I have done obedience right alongside the um, there's a gas station on one side and the other side was uh, a very busy highway right next to an overpass over the interstate so there's a lot of traffic there and there's a strip of, of grass maybe like uh, 20 feet wide or so and you know 100 feet long and um, I've shown a video of myself training my dog there but that didn't start that way it started just by taking him out and of course he was scared and a little nervous with all that going on but I was able to socialize or in other words develop a positive experience around that environment and get the dog to focus on me with all that going on. So we need to gradually increase the stimulation. I particularly like um, hardware stores or not, not pet stores that allow pets, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> into their stores. <coughs> I particularly like non-pet stores that allow pets in their store for this reason. I feel like, my opinion, is that those places have a much lower threshold for misconduct from dogs. So if you're at Home Depot, say, walking your dog around the store and there's any kind of foolishness or misbehavior, I feel like because obviously people don't go there just for dogs, uh, even though they're a great tool for that. Other, other store management and employees aren't, are much less likely to tolerate or accept that, to revoke that privilege of allowing animals in their store. So there are some places that are good for this. Um, of course, Home Depot and Lowe's, Tractor Supply Company, um, I know that Michael's, uh, the craft store, um, is a good one. I, I kind of I just found out about that, and I like that as well because it's some different smells and sights and engagement for the dog. But also with those places, especially the uh, hardware stores, they tend to have huge parking lots, and this is great because you can get a really in incremental gauge on the stimulation you provide for your dog. So, um, getting off a little bit into the obedience territory here. 
you might start way in the back of the parking lot where all the cars or 95% of the cars are 100 feet or more away from you. The same with the whole store front. So you're not even inside the store yet. And gradually you move up a few rows, move up a few rows where there are more and more cars. The cars are driving around um, and then get up to the storefront where people are walking around and there's some sights and smells and noises going on and then work your way into the store so that those stores are good for that reason because you have an incremental control over the stimulation you provide to the dog parks regular people parks state parks national forests things like that non-dog parks are pretty good for this purpose as well especially if you can find a large um, secluded area away from other people who might be picnicking grilling tailgating playing with their dogs um, as I said before you must 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 be the advocate for your dog you have to have to it is your responsibility to have good boundaries and if necessary be kind of nasty to people who don't respect the boundaries and rules you have for your dog. So you can find a secluded place, again, very similar to the hardware stores, where you're, you're removed enough that you are able to get your dog to focus on you regardless of the distractions in the environment. Your dog probably can smell, maybe even see and hear other people, other dogs, and other things going on, but it should be pretty easy for you to redirect your dog to you. And, you know, like I said, with the hardware stores, you can gradually get closer and closer and closer to that stimulation. When it comes to pet stores, you must be very, very careful. This is a very high risk environment. Every, not everybody that says their dog is good with people is or is good with other dogs knows what they're talking about um, it could just be that they've never had a bad situation happen yet they've gotten lucky kind of like saying that you don't need to wear your seat belt because you haven't gotten into a wreck yet it doesn't make any sense so again you have to be on the lookout it is your responsibility to control the environment that you are bring, you are subjecting your dog to that includes your home as well, by the way. So the reason pet stores are dangerous is because there are just as many people as the other stores, but there are exponentially more dogs, particularly more misbehaving dogs, especially to big box pet stores that offer um, pet training and stuff at the store. Well, if people were competent or capable to train their dogs themselves, they wouldn't be coming to the pet store for training for help. So take that into consideration. It doesn't mean those people are doing anything wrong. It's just something to be aware of. Plus, you have to consider the close proximity in the store. So if this is a huge pet peeve of mine, people just letting their dogs go all the way to the end of a six foot leash, there is so much bad stuff that can happen within a six foot radius of a person. I, I mean, aisles in pet stores aren't even six feet wide. So you literally have more than the width of an entire aisle for the worst possible situations that you can imagine to happen. You have no idea what is around any given corner, person-wise or dog-wise, or when a fight could break out in a pet store. Give it a Google. Have a look on the internet. That Dog fights in pet stores happen all the time. This is why you need to be especially careful when you take your dog to a pet store. It's great, it can be a great tool, but it can also be very, very dangerous. When it comes to other dogs, this is gonna be a very important tool in your toolbox, but you also need to be careful with it. I'll attach a video here of how to not do this. And in the video that I'll show, I don't think there was anything, um, I don't think there were any bad intentions from the people in the video that I shot. Um, but I think like a lot of pet owners, they fall into a category of 
they just don't know what they don't know and they have good intentions they're trying their best but um, they're missing some pretty serious signs where they are extremely lucky that two big strong German Shepherds um, did not get into a fight with each other it, it would have been a bloody mess and it would have been a, a literal bloody mess um, and absolutely terrible because the people were friends and they just wanted their dogs to meet so this wasn't like a willful negligence where people are uh, mistreating their animals and allowing bad things to happen these people were they, they wanted something good and they had good intentions but they were ill-informed What would I change in that video then? Well, for starters, it looks like the people are fairly stable. So that's crucial as well. But what's not happening is a stable dog to test your dog around. I take my dog to, friend, dog to friends' houses all the time, but I know those people well. I know that they will respect my boundaries and my wishes with my dog. So when I say, hey, Michelle, ignore my dog, she will leave my dog alone, not pet him, and other people who might be at the house at that time won't pet the dog either. That allows me to have a much easier task of redirecting my dog to me when, say, her dog is running around the house. So I've also found it easier to do this with dogs of the opposite gender, as well as an older dog. So uh, maybe, maybe an old enough dog that is just kind of over it and likes to lounge around and doesn't really have much interest in like running and jumping and playing and that stuff even if they do play um you know we've all seen dogs that get older and they kind of just like people start to prefer lounging around those are great to socialize your dog around because your dog can see that oh this other animal they're chill just like we wanted our dog to look at us while we played it cool in various environments, we want them to look at other dogs and learn from other dogs. Okay, that'll be all right. Just, you do your thing over there, I'm gonna keep doing my business over here. So, branching off of that, it's a huge, huge problem when two strangers say, let's have our dogs meet. That is how dog fights happen. Um, you wouldn't just walk up to a stranger on the street and say, hey, let's be, let's be best friends. Why don't you come over to my house? Or can I like drive your car? No, you can't pet my dog either for those same reasons. Um, again and again, you're asking for trouble to happen um, because you don't know anything about that dog. You don't know how they're gonna react. So I prefer to have my dog ignore other people and other dogs in public. Even in my home, when I, I mentioned like going to a friend's house, but even in my home, I give people very clear instructions. I want you to treat my dog how you would treat me. So if you wouldn't run up to me and rub my cheeks, I, I know my face is furry. Um, if you wouldn't run up to me and pinch my cheeks and rub my belly, um, if you would, you need to talk about some different things other than dogs. But if you're going to do that, uh, or if you wouldn't do that to me, don't even think about doing it to my dog. And I found this to be a, a good benchmark that is fair, both for it's, it's easy for me to remember, it's clear for me to remember, which means it's clear and easy to communicate to my dog, my dog to remember, I feel like it's fair to my dog and it's fair to the people that come to my home. So, um, again, if you want to treat me that way, don't treat my dog that way. So, if 
we're two guys and we're just hanging out you know if you would give me a, a pat on the shoulder or uh, a handshake then it's acceptable and appropriate as my dog walks by especially if we live together um, I do have a roommate here so it's not fair to always expect my roommate to live with this dog I don't feel it's fair to always expect my roommate to live with this dog and never be allowed to touch it because sometimes the dog might accidentally or on purpose brush against that other person so my rule is it is acceptable to treat the dog how you would treat me so if you're um, if you would pet my pat my shoulder like a pat on the back or uh, you know whatever your form of handshake or greeting is for me um, I don't really let people pet my, uh, hug my dog though even though I made that motion it's okay for my roommate to um, you know like a long a long pet and a pat on my dog I allow that. That's acceptable. It seems appropriate. It seems fair to me and the other people involved. So definitely consider the nature of the relationship you have with other people and other dogs. You want to make sure that the model for your dog that you're having your dog learn from is a stable, chill dog. A dog that is very neutral. This is especially important when you start socializing your dog because those initial experience are gonna have a disproportionate impact on your dog than later experiences. In other words, the things that happen right out of the gate that are very new in the dog's life are gonna set the stage for how the dog approaches other people, other dogs, other environments, and all the variables that they're gonna see in their life. I want to throw a couple more tips in here about how exactly to redirect your dog to, to you. I put out videos before about types of food um, or types of rewards. I put out a Q&A about dogs not taking treats, uh, which talks about um, drive and the quality of the food rewards and a couple other things specific to food. But that is going to be the biggest tool. I go, whenever I go to a public place with my dog, I always bring treats. And again, depending on where you're at with generalizing obedience and proofing it, you might wear a full on um, treat pouch. I do that all the time. Or you might move to just putting a handful of food in your pocket. Of course the dog can still smell it, but it is a little, a little more discreet. So food is going to be the number one thing that I use to redirect my dog, even if I have to hold it in front of his nose, or in some cases I've had to kind of cup my dog's chin while I'm holding, uh, if the snout is like this, hold under my dog's chin so the food is like right up against his nose, but I can uh, manually sort of redirect the dog's gaze to me. And if, even if he's kind of like side-eyeing that other situation that's happening the second his eyes come back to me I mark and reward so food is going to be the number one thing restraint and control of your dog is obviously important because above all else you have to protect your dog and keep your dog safe but keep in mind like I said in the beginning of the video dogs have an opposition reflex so um, the harder you pull on a dog the more they're gonna pull against you so in that case you need to become exciting. You need to become more interested, sorry, more interesting than that other thing that's going on or that you're trying to keep your dog away from. This is where having incremental control over that stimulation is super important because if you've crossed that threshold and now the dog is fixated on that other thing, you've gone way too far and you need to get out of that situation as soon as possible. Okay. So what's a much better alternative is to err on the side of caution and make sure that you can always redirect your dog to you and be able to bail out of a situation so that you don't find yourself cornered in a pet store with um, dogs that are um, you know, heckled up or have something else, or just maybe one is heckled up and uh, aggressive and another is just like running around unchecked on a long leash in a narrow aisle. You don't wanna end up there in a situation that you can't control. Remember that this all starts with you playing it cool. So I've also done videos uh, where I'm just sitting outside of a store or some public place with my dog and every time a person walks by, I'm marking and rewarding my dog for just laying down. 
It doesn't necessarily have to be focused on me the entire time, but I want him to ignore those other things. I want him to know that other people are not scary, cars going by are not scary, and if you stay still when a car or a person or a bicycle goes by, you get a reward. It's pretty simple. So to summarize, you need to have a clear understanding of what socialization is and what it means for you. Typically, for me, that means I'm able to build good experiences for my dog in a multitude of environments, and I'm able to redirect my dog's attention to me in those environments. And the way we do that, again in summary, is to play it cool, gradually increase the stimulation, and only only utilize stable dogs and stable people that you can trust. And when you put those tools together, you have a very composed, a very social dog that again, it's neither fearful or anxious, and it's not running up to inappropriately, running up to and jumping on other people, be that in public or in your home. So thank you for watching, Diligent Canine, and I appreciate your support on Patreon.